For much of their history, steamships, including ocean liners, were fueled by coal. This fossil fuel is what kept the boilers hot and steam pressure up. But it can be easy to forget or simply not realize that fueling up a coal-powered ocean liner was not as easy as pulling it up to the pier and hooking up to a fuel pump while passengers disembarked. In fact, when we look at it through the lens of modern shipping, where ships can be fueled in a matter of hours while other components of the turnaround process are completed, it is awe-inspiring how cumbersome and time-consuming it was to load ocean liners up with coal. Awe-inspiring for us, perhaps, but burdensome for shipping companies and dreadful for the men who carried out the actual work. After a crossing and all the passengers had disembarked, the ship would be moved outward from the side of the pier by, say, 20 feet. This was to allow the coal barges to come up alongside the ship. The barges were unpowered, so they had to be towed or pushed into place by another vessel or pulled by horses on shore. But once the coal barges were alongside, the real work was about to begin. But first, the ship itself had to be prepared for the task. Every ventilator cowl was covered with canvas. Every access door was shut. Passenger areas were sealed. Portholes were closed where possible. All of this was because things were about to get messy, and the pristine liner which would carry paying passengers could not afford to be saturated with coal dust, or her reputation and that of her owner would be tarnished. While this was going on, the ship's carpenter was rappelling down the side of the ship to do a simple job that only he was qualified for, opening the coaling ports. Most ocean liners during the age of coal received their fuel through openings in the hull toward the waterline. These openings were appropriately called coal ports, and they fed to the coal chutes which, in turn, fed to the bunkers. Since the ports were large openings close to the waterline, they had to be watertight and very strong. The openings were subject to all the forces of the open ocean and the stress placed on the hull as the ship traveled over waves. On the inside of each coal port, a cast steel brace, or strong back, ensured that the port was strong and watertight. A threaded steel stud would extend from the strong back and run through the coal port door, and a large nut on the outside secured the door firmly to the hull. Once the ship was sealed and the coal ports opened, the coaling process, otherwise known as bunkering, could start. And the pressure was on. Coaling the ship would take between 24 and 48 hours, depending on the ship, the port, and the crew doing the job. There were countless other things to be done to turn around the ship and prepare it for the next crossing, and an express liner had a tight schedule to keep, and a reputation which depended on her adherence to said schedule. To top off the pressure, all other work was limited because the ship was all but locked down for the coaling process. A single coal barge could typically hold between 500 and 1,000 tons of coal at a time. The crew on the barge filled quarter-ton buckets with coal. High above, simple derricks, also known as outriggers, were swung out from the side of the superstructure. From the outriggers, block and tackle, or pulley systems, hauled the quarter-ton buckets up from the deck of the barges to the mouth of the coal ports. Men on precarious, temporary platforms adjacent to the coal port openings guided the buckets as the coal emptied loudly into the chutes. While all this work was going on on the outside of the ship, trimmers inside the ship were at work moving the coal to its proper locations. The men were typically divided into teams of six, and one team could handle 12 to 15 tons of coal per hour with the help of wheelbarrows and shovels. The work of the trimmers was at the direction of the ship's chief engineer, who was responsible for ensuring that the ship remained on an even keel in terms of list and pitch throughout the coaling process. The work of the trimmers inside the ship was particularly grueling and dangerous. The men had only a wet rag covering their face to protect them from the harmful coal dust that the rest of the ship was so carefully shielded from. It's no wonder that absenteeism among trimmers was highest during the bunkering process. Given that firemen were undoubtedly the toughest men aboard an ocean liner, and that they carried out hard physical labor in the intense heat and dim light of boiler rooms, it is clear that the task of moving coal during bunkering was nearly intolerable, if they so commonly did not show up for work. Once bunkering was finally complete, the ship's carpenter would once again make his way down the side of the ship to secure the coal ports. This had to be done in a particular way so as not to pose a risk to the ship while at sea. Remember that the coal ports are large openings in the hull, not far above the waterline. The carpenter, with great expertise, uses a buckram gasket soaked in red lead to ensure water tightness before shutting the coal port openings and replacing the nuts which hold the door firmly against the hull of the ship. The critical nature of this key task was made apparent when, during World War I, a worker in one of the boiler rooms aboard Cunard's Mauritania noticed ocean water seeping into the bilge from one of the coal bunkers. 
The rate of flooding was more than the pumps could manage, and the ship soon took on a noticeable list to port. Fortunately, the crew was able to properly seal the coal ports, but one can imagine the potential for disaster from a seemingly small oversight. The immense task of bunkering was difficult for the crew involved, but on the business side, securing and purchasing coal was often difficult for shipping companies as well. For starters, there were many different types of coal, each with their own characteristics and quality. Coal is essentially fossilized vegetation, and so it makes sense that the coal found in different regions would be different in nature and quality. In the interest of time, and to save you from the chemistry, suffice it to say that coal is primarily made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and that the proportions of these elements influence the energy produced during combustion. The output was traditionally measured in terms of British thermal units per pound, or BTU. Welsh coal, as it turns out, had the highest BTU of 16,000 and was considered the best in the business. Luckily for Great Britain, Welsh coal was very accessible. More generally, British coal was considered to be superior to American coal because it did not have the high dust content that American coal was famous for, dust being problematic for a variety of reasons including the messiness that I alluded to earlier. The type of coal that a ship was running on affected the efficiency of the ship, the frequency of boiler cleanings, and even the wear and tear on the machinery itself. Naturally, shipping companies vied for the best they could get. But it was often the case that they would be lucky to get any coal at all, or at least lucky to get enough to run all of their ships. Coal shortages were common. If you are a frequent watcher of this channel, you're likely familiar with at least a few instances in which coal supply, or lack thereof, has impacted shipping schedules and capacity. For example, the National Coal Strike of 1912 meant that the White Star Line could not secure enough coal to fuel its entire fleet. With Olympic having entered service the year before and Titanic preparing for her maiden voyage, the company decided to divert its limited coal supply so as to ensure that at least Olympic and Titanic could sail. This meant that the Oceanic, among others, were left waiting for fuel, resulting in the company's loss of revenue. But even when the supply of coal was not an issue, it still wasn't necessarily easy to feed hungry ocean liners. Coal suppliers have been known to use certain tricks to boost their own profit margins. If a shipping line paid three pounds per ton for a 1,000 ton coal barge, the supplier would surely accept the full 3,000 pounds, but might only arrive alongside the liner with 950 tons of coal. Company officials might have had a keen eye for a light barge load, but suppliers were tricky. A common tactic was to include a foreign object in the load of coal so that less coal was needed to make the barge appear full. Common objects included animal carcasses or even wire cages constructed explicitly for the purpose of shorting the customer. Another more brazen and elaborate tactic was for workers on the barge to discreetly toss some of the coal over the side during the bunkering process. Divers would later have to go out and recover the coal but it might have been easier to evade the watchful eye of the captain or other company officials by using this method. As Captain Arthur Rostron points out in his autobiography, these practices did more than just to hurt shipping companies financially. It put the ships themselves in danger, along with their passengers. Even though officers and engineers tended to be conservative with fuel estimates, schedules and plans on the high seas are always subject to change due to weather or any other factor, and a steamship without steam is a hazard to herself and to others. Thankfully, I cannot point to any incidents like this resulting from stingy coal suppliers, but if you know of one, please let me know in the comments section. When obtaining sufficient coal was not a problem, retaining the workforce necessary to use the coal often was. The ship's boilers did not feed themselves, and huge teams of rugged men had to be willing to work in the brutal and dangerous conditions of the boiler rooms in a well-choreographed process of moving coal and feeding it to the boilers in just the right way and at just the right pace. Add to that the necessity of spending weeks away from home, it is no wonder that shipping companies had a hard time keeping up the steam. For example, in 1900, Shipping companies around the world faced a shortage of trimmers and stokers, which left them with no choice but to lay up some of their ships and run others at reduced speeds. After the sinking of Titanic in 1912, the firemen aboard her sister Olympic refused to go to sea until safety aboard the liner was improved, and Olympic ultimately did not cross the Atlantic again until changes were made. This incident highlighted the world's dependence on the men who kept the steamships running, even if most people never saw or thought of them. With all of these problems and expenses, it is no wonder that shipping lines ran away from coal as a fuel once technology allowed them to do so. After the First World War, express liners were pulled from service one by one for conversion. They would emerge as oil-burning ships. 
This was a months-long process and a huge investment for the shipping lines, but the return would prove worthwhile despite the fact that oil cost three times as much as coal. With that said, the transition from coal-burning ships to oil-burning ships deserves its own video, and I will end this one here. Remember to check out the Great Big Move shop for new merch, and as always, thank you for watching. Thank you.